Well, well. So this is time for us to uh, kick back a little bit, as evidenced in, uh, by the chairs that we're sitting in. These are very comfortable. Gee, I could have done with this a bit earlier. Um, so this is your time, audience, uh, for a very uh, informal and uh, an open conversation. So plenty of roving mics uh, around for your questions. Uh, please feel free to tweet them through uh, as well. We can take those uh, questions uh, off social media and we can also ask a few questions of each other. That could be a bit fun. That could be a bit fun. Well, why, why don't we kick off with... You guys have... Whoops. We're back. Uh, you guys have just had a, a helicopter ride just over Geelong. How was that? Yeah, we survived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. <laughs> awesome, awesome uh, ride to see the uh, city and uh, get a, a good context of what we're talking about here. Yeah, we even took a quick tour of the Alco and, and the, uh, the Ford plants. And uh, although I will say, we were talking about it on the way back, that Maybe we should have done the ride after this panel because I feel like I've had a massage. It's very relaxed. Like, <laughs> I just want to take a nap. So long. Is the, has the audio coming through all right? It's a bit patchy. A bit patchy. We can grab the other mic if we need to. Uh, so, Jody, you, you've heard. This isn't working, is it? I'm going, I'm going the old fashioned way. Is that any better? Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Support from all layers of government, local, state, federal government. Has there been a better time for Geelong to, uh, to embrace the digital economy? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think it's amazing the support um, coming back to, to here and the focus. And I think it's very forward thinking, actually, of the support that's coming here. And even this conference is evidence of that, bringing people in that have new ideas, um, fresh ideas that you can take back to your workplaces and, and help transfer those through the wider community is just a brilliant thing. Fantastic. Elizabeth, you're experiencing and driving firsthand a, a change in a city that you've said is comparable in some ways to Geelong. Are we ripe here for innovation and, and ready to take the next step? Yeah, I, I got that, that question asked this morning from a journalist, so I think she's writing an article about it, but I absolutely think that Geelong is incredibly well po poised to take advantage of the BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals that you've got, um, just as we have. Um, you've got an incredible commitment in your community to make things change. You've got wonderful councillors and government representatives that are supportive of you and mayors. Um, I think that's just wonderful. The business community is very, very alive here. Um, you've got Deakin University, which is critical. Look, you've got a beautiful backdrop. You're very close to Melbourne. Uh, you've got your own airport. Um, I think what you have is just wonderful. And everything that you're doing, just keep doing it. Keep believing in yourselves. Um, we also started to talk uh, a little bit about maybe a Jidlong, Wollongong, sister city Ooh. relationship where we share. Like, I've learned a lot. Um, in this conference about things that you're doing well. I hope that we could share a lot from Mike Accelerate's perspective what we've done well and, and, and who knows what we could learn from that and gain from each other. Wonderful. Adam, you heard the insights from Robert Scoble uh, and some pretty incredible frictionless connected everything in the post-mobile era. Are you excited or scared by what it means for security and, and protecting? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Excited because I think that's that's just where things are going to have to go. There's a momentum that you can't fight. Um, so the world will become more online, more connected, internet of things. It's all going to happen. You can't stand in the way of progress. Um, and a little bit terrified because in my job I see all the internet. <laughs> so all you, every time you connect something to the internet, there's another potential source of pain for you. So I think. I think for me, it's, uh, we need to do this. Um, it makes absolute sense. How do you do it safely? And, uh, and I think that's, that's the message. Um, can I ask a question, perhaps, of, of, of Elizabeth, if that's okay? Um, so this sister city type arrangement. Um, Wollongong, I think I had the sense that it, it went through its struggle with the manufacturing downturn, possibly before Geelong experienced it. Um, is there something that you would do um, quicker, um, it's something that you think that Geelong should be doing um, that you wish Wollongong had done a little bit earlier in its journey? That's a great question. 
Um, and I think it has to do with culture. And what I mean there is have big, hairy, audacious goals. Belief, belief in oneself that one can achieve. Um, all of the clusters that you heard me talk about in my talk were all small. Even Silicon Valley was small when I lived there as a kid. Um, it was small, it was a regional um, town outside of San Francisco. If it weren't for the investment that the Defense Department and then Hewlett Packard put into the valley, it never would have got where it would have got. The same with Waterloo was at one time, I think I didn't mention the statistics, but I like to quote them a lot. It was a $100 million economy 15 years ago. It's an $18 billion economy now. 28,000 new jobs in just 15 years. So all of the Boulder, Colorado is, is a small, tight community. Otunyami is outside the, the city of Helsinki. Um, Berlin is actually a relatively small European city. All those clusters, they depend on this sort of um, currency of trust that small communities have. So I reckon dream big and go for it. I love that. Dream big and go for it. Fantastic. Just check in with our uh, floor. We've got a question from Nick Stanley. Just behind you, you're just about to be mic'd up. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, I think that's, a, that's fantastic feedback. Um, what I see locally is that we have people who dare to dream big and are willing to go after it. I think one of the things with, um, and I'm totally blunt about this, I think to some extent the community's got to be prepared to accept people who have big ideas as well. And that's one of the things with regional cities, especially in Australia, there's a cultural, of, a cultural element of tall poppy. And that is something that, um, as, a, as a regional city and as a country, we need to get better at supporting people who want to achieve things because it's only through achieving things that new things will happen. Um, so that's sort of like an observation I had. I wanted to ask Robert a question because this is sort of like a, a test question that we were talking about before. Um, and it's in relation to the vision that Robert had and some of the stuff he was talking about. Um, my question is, do you see a future where people are actively disconnecting? And it's sort of odd for the chair of ICT to say that, but people who don't buy into the technology, people who don't buy into the digital di disruption and actively rail against it and move against it. I, I already see that. Uh, there is a a backlash, a, a new kind of digital divide between people like me who are all in and people who are scared by this technology. And it is a scary technology, but it, here's the way I look at it. There's an app called TripIt. I don't know, anybody use TripIt here? A few? If we had this conversation 20 years ago and somebody would say, in the future, uh, we're going to have companies that are going to get access to your email and look around and pull stuff out of your email and take it back to their company and then do stuff and they're going to have your credit card and they're going to have access to your GPS where you're located. We would be like, no way. <laughs> and that's a horrible idea, right? But TripIt has that today on my phone. And I interviewed the CEO of TripIt several years ago, and he told me, if I say your flight's being canceled, it's being canceled because I'm hooked into the air traffic control system, and I have the best record out there. And one night I was in Chicago on the runway, and TripIt said your flight's being canceled. Would you like another seat on another airline? I said yes, and it had my credit card, so it made that very easy. Two minutes later, the pilot comes on and says, we couldn't start an engine, and we need to go back to the gate. And I've been working with the maintenance people for 20 minutes trying to fix it. And we don't have another engine. We don't have another plane. We're, we, you're going to have to stay in Chicago, and our customer service people will take care of you. I had one of those three seats. I won that night. It's, it, it, this is a competitive world. I won that night. The Apple Watch has already saved one life. The other technologies I've shown you have saved four lives. Soon we're going to have winners and losers in this world. And if you choose to stay off the grid, you're going to lose. And you're going to lose big. So that's the choice you have as a community. Do you want to be in 
and be part of the future? Or do you want to stay off the grid and lose? Because you're going to lose. <laughs> All in, Robert Scoble. <laughs> Great insights. Uh, other questions from the floor? Sorry, question down. Uh, Mike, just down the front. Mike, the mic is on the way. Uh, my question is to Robert and Brian. It's about the amazing technology in the future and where we're going with all of those connected technologies coming and the displacement of workers. So we've got all this free time to get into our virtual reality. Um, how are we going to pay for that? Like, if we, if we don't have jobs, what's, um, what's, what's the future of this new, new economy 10 or 15 years down the track? What will people be doing for, for money? And, uh, how, how does this economy work? This is, this is the conversation we have at dinner in Silicon Valley. You guys will just keep going. Well, because <laughs> we know there is massive job dislocations. I mean, I toured the, uh, the manufacturing plant of the future at, at uh, J-Bill, and it didn't have any people in it. And it's making a lot of stuff. It <laughs> makes basketballs with sensors in it. Um, I think we're going to come up with many new kinds of jobs, and I'm optimistic about that. I don't know what they all are yet, but we're going to uh, come up with new art forms. I mean, in Silicon Valley, we have huge buildings filled with nerds who build movies. There's people standing, sitting in front of two computer screens. I toured uh, uh, Lucas Arts, where they ma they made Star Wars. There, there's row after row after row of nerds sitting in front of computer screens, and they make the entertainment we all love, right? I I met uh, on the way back from Dubai. I was hanging out with the guy who makes costumes for for Star Trek. They just were filming over in Dubai, and he said, you know, my dad made costumes. Uh, for many movies, and he had to actually make costumes. I make uh, clothing with 32 white targets on it that the actors wear, and there's a, 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 a sensor that watches the actor moving, and it puts the costume on digitally, so the nerd made the costume. So can you make a new entertainment form using virtual reality? Can you make a new entertainment district here in the new in the big factories? Because I go to Universal Studios in, in Southern California, and what is a TV studio? It's a big-ass building like what you got. So can you rethink the use of that building and do something new and innovative with it? I don't know. Uh, I think we're going to come up with new kinds of jobs. We're going to have to have... Uh, our world needs expertise on machine learning and artificial intelligence, vision uh, systems. Um, uh, we need to build new kinds of things for these cars that are going to have self-driving cars. We're going to need new kinds of forms of entertainment. We're going to need uh, new kinds of things that are going to sit on our skin and study whether we're healthy or not. And that means we're going to need new insurance kinds of uh, uh, platforms for these things, right? There's going to be huge shifts. But it also often opens up new opportunities for massive new jobs. And I think that's what you learn in Silicon Valley. You know, I, I grew up in Silicon Valley too, and, and we used to farm. We, had, we paved over the best apricot orchards in the world. And if you're living in Silicon Valley or if you visit there and you know somebody who has an old apricot tree in their backyard, uh, that is wondrous in July. But we don't farm anymore. I mean, I, FMC uh, started their Farm Machinery Corporation, and today they make military machines, right? <laughs> they, they turn plows into tanks, right? And then now we don't even make those anymore in Silicon Valley. We make other kinds of things, drones and stuff, right? Well, Robert, we need to design things and we need to secure them. So, Jody, your business has had incredible growth over the last few years. Why don't you reflect on some of those new roles that you're seeing? Because I'd imagine some of those job categories you're hiring for just didn't exist five years ago. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I, I think that I, I started my career, I was called a usability consultant. And you know that was very early 
um, in the stage of technology and you had to sort of have an argument for um, doing that stuff up front. It was you, you were a hygiene sort of factor at the end of once something has been built, a tick in the box in some ways. Um, but now that, um, now that it, we, we consider whole experiences, it's almost like you become the architect of everything because um, technology is out there everywhere for us to interact with. So it's in stores, it's in, in branches, it's walking down the street. Um, and, and that then creates new collisions of careers. Like I, as a psychologist, I never would have thought that my skills would be useful to this field. Um, lucky for me they are, because understanding humans is useful. Um, we're partnering up with um, people that are interior designers, architects, so that we can lay out spaces. We worked recently with a, um, a pattern maker and a stylist because we were designing um, new uniforms for a special service. So it's, it's mind-blowing to think that from those days of usability and all about the technology interface, that now the experiences that we're designing and considering uh, are so broad and, and very exciting, really. Um, it, makes, it makes my job really interesting because there's such variety there. Mm, wonderful. And Brian, you spend a lot of time with some of the world's leading brands on this topic of digital transformation. How are you seeing the types of roles inside large organisations change? All right, how much time do we have? Yeah, it is um, it's just a joke because it's not changing as fast as it should. Um, real quick though, to, to just follow up on that last question that you asked, there's a, there's a fantastic report out called Humans Need Not Apply. And it looks at the, the last 100 years of all of the jobs that have been completely erased due to technology. Um, but it also forecasts for you what some of the, the best jobs in the future are going to be. And I would, I would look at that. But I also want to give you one note of caution. Uh, and that is that as much as we tell ourselves that we need to be digital, we also have to think at, at, at scale, digital becomes something that, like factories, get outsourced. And one of the interesting trends that's happening right now is that there are schools opening up all around third world countries to teach uh, citizens how to code. And they're basically creating these code factories of which then get outsourced to big companies all around the world so that they can get coding done at a fraction of the rate, yet at the same time put money into economies that could really use it. So these types of in-demand jobs are, are, are already being outsourced to, to other countries. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that um, Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of LinkedIn, calls this the uh, economic graph. There, there are, on LinkedIn right now, which is probably one of the, the, the largest professional data sets in the world, knows exactly the types of jobs companies are hiring for and knows exactly the types of expertise that we ourselves post in the network. And he has noticed an incredibly big and increasing gap between the two. Uh, so I even think that before we look at the jobs of the future, we should look at the jobs of the present and, and help. We talked about culture and the importance of culture, sort of help retrain the current workforce to be able to do the jobs that we need today before we freak them out about thinking uh, you know, for the future. And on this note, though, on digital transformation, for those who don't know what that is, it's, it's how companies take a formal effort to change on the inside out uh, new, new models, new processes, new philosophies of how, how to compete today and compete for the future. Uh, and where, where a lot of these new roles and a lot of these new changes are starting are just, they're, they're all purpose driven. What are we really trying to do and what do we need to learn? Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of times that's looking at employee centricity, as well as the digital customer experience is, is, a, is, a, is a primary driver of how do you re-examine the customer journey and, and, and recreate the, the journey to be much more effective uh, for mobile, for digital, to be omnichannel. And so you start to see these new types of very sophisticated and thoughtful experience architects uh, coming up to re-imagine re what the employee and the customer experience can be because they're so critical to the, the future business. And then one final note, and, I, and I, I'm a big fan of experience architecture, uh, but you, if, you, if you spend any time with Robert about all of the neat toys and, and the neat game-changing technologies that are coming out, you're also going to need experience architects to create these new worlds for uh, whether it's Magic Leap or whether it's Oculus Rift or you know, every, every, those are just platforms, right? And someone's going to have to come across and reimagine and create fresh new thinking and apply that thinking to design and apply that design to development. And so there's a lot of, 
higher, higher uh, stream types of uh, roles for all of us to just think bigger than just mere coding, because I already start to see coding becoming sort of a, a, common, a common thing that's already being outsourced. Wonderful. Uh, one one, one uh, rethink. A lot of government officials ask me how, how to make an enterprise zone like this happen. How, how do you make a uh, startup hub happen? How do you uh, make an Israel happen? And, and if some of your members should go to Israel and really understand why that small nation has uh, become a, a real powerhouse in the world of technology and startups. I think it comes down to, uh, several people have said this, keeping smart people in your community, particularly the younger smart people, the 14-year-old who's coming up and is, gonna, uh, is playing on an iPad today and learning how to code and going into a technical degree. How do you keep that person, that girl or that guy uh, here in, in Geelong? Start by thinking what, are, what is gonna drive them to keep their company here if they start a company? What's going to uh, keep them from moving away? So you start uh, approaching it from many levels. Look at SoundCloud. They went to Munich because they had great nightclubs. If you're young, you care about that, right? You care about entertainment, having something to do in the evening, having a fun, youthful scene in the downtown district where you can uh, go out with your coworkers and, uh, and have a fun place to live. You think about broadband. How do I get a, a company that's going to build this new uh, virtual reality entertainment company? Where are you going to decide to uh, start that company? It has to have the best infrastructure in the world. So you have to start investing in, broad, in the bleeding edge broadband, even beyond 5, 5G, right? You start thinking about tax structures to incent people to start companies and make it possible for them to compete with the global world. And on and on. You start thinking like that and you start solving those problems and all of a sudden you have an economy that's rocking and rolling here and people are moving here from around the world because it's an interesting place to live and that you guys have a lot of uh, advantages right off the bat, right? It's a nice place to live. It's a beautiful place to live. It's beautiful. Yeah, but you put the best fiber into this country, and maybe I put a data center in here, and all of a sudden people are building businesses all around that data center. Maybe Facebook opens an engineering office, and all of a sudden people are moving here, right? And on and on, and it starts spiraling and building a, a economy that's very, very strong. Just uh, open for a question from the floor. We've got one through Twitter, I think. This is a question from Kathy Walker via Twitter. She says, uh, digital exclusion is the new disadvantage. What would you do for people to bridge the divide? I think that's what this I hope that my presentation today was very much about that. Um, in particular, um, I was talking about how our female co-founders that have entered I Accelerate um, largely because of the lack of women in the STEM disciplines uh, don't come in equipped as CTOs with 18 years experience like some of the other ones do. Um, but by engaging in what's already available online, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of tools that allows entrepreneurs to rapidly build early versions of their product and then very, very rapidly do various different kinds of user testing. Um, so I guess what I would encourage very much so are these learning clusters. I saw it work very effectively also in Finland when I visited Otunyami. They have learning clusters around wearable technology. They'll have learning clusters around, you know, different health issues. They'll have learning clusters around pharmaceuticals. Um, so, and, and it is incredibly surprising at how much you probably already know, or let's refer to, you know, the, the, the earlier generation that's growing up with iPads and so on, how much they already know and how much you probably already know to share um, with them. So peer-to-peer -peer learning, I think, is critical. There, is so much, there are so many technologies in the world, none of us know them all. There's no one source. And so by sharing, you really create an incredible network of capability that you can draw from. Another question from the floor. Andrew. Uh, Elizabeth, this one's for you. As a uh, life sentence entrepreneur myself, um, 
what you're doing with AI Accelerate is fantastic, and um, I really applaud it, and I think it's, it's great for Illawarra, and um, obviously Geelong and places like this with the new digital um, are going to benefit from this. But the question really is, startups, you know, you're talking about big, audacious, you know, hairy goals, these sort of things. A lot of startups fail, some succeed. How do you sort of plan to work with these entrepreneurs where their first, second, third shot may not work, but the fourth shot sort of does? I mean, from a financial um, and also, I guess, a, an emotional sort of level, do you continue to support them all the way through or do you sort of give up if they don't hit it straight off the bat? That's a really great question. Um, one of the things that I've learned uh, from many other clusters, in particular Waterloo, they're very proud because they were on their second, third, and fourth generation of entrepreneurs. And that's when the, the ecosystem is very rich. You have very, very experienced entrepreneurs who have failed a couple of times. I've seen Steve Blank tell his really funny story about um, it took him six goes to get to hit the jackpot. His fifth go, he lost $38 million of his investors' money. And his mother said, well, where did you put it? Um, and uh, one of our early e-club speakers um, was one of the first companies that got um, funded by Startmate. I don't know if you know Nikki Shavak, but he's a wonderful supporter of Startmates in Sydney. Exited six months later to Walmart for uh, well over $10 million. Um, that was the sixth try that he had on, on that. So absolutely, doesn't matter if you failed. We don't even try and avoid the word failure. Uh, if the first idea doesn't work, get on to the second. We have an alumni program, so uh, companies come into iAccelerate, they do pay for the services that they get. Um, they're often bootstrapped. Uh, so if their idea isn't working, they're not gonna keep staying on. But what we do have is an alumni program. We keep inviting them back to socialize with their peers because it's that peer-to-peer -peer network that's really important. We give them a hot desk. You know, we welcome them. We're starting to brainstorm their next idea with them. We're refining it before they apply again. And I think that's a really fantastic point that you raise is um, we've seen the need, and that's through trial and error, of keeping in contact with that base. Because when you talk to them, they said, wow, I wish I would have done this, that, and the other much, much sooner. Fantastic. Adam, you, what are some of the exciting startup businesses? I know Telstra made a small investment in a company called TeleSign recently, but there seems to be a lot of new startup businesses in the security space. Is there any that, that jump to mind? In the US, in, um, in the RSA conference every year, there's an innovator's corner. And, um, and uh, the intent of that is to get all the new security startups and all the um, venture capitalists together and uh, they can have a look at what's coming through and they can make decisions about what's likely to see and how they can invest. And it's a terrific idea. Um, and out of that, some of the uh, some of the biggest names and most innovative software solutions, I think uh, FireEye, for instance, which is a, a significant uh, company, I think every Australian uh, or significant Australian business would have a FireEye appliance these days, the same worldwide. There's lots of good um, lots of good innovation happening there. I think um, I think what's interesting to me is, and, and not just having a security background, but seeing having spent my life in operations in IT. And um, Brian, your comments resonated with me, seeing stuff move offshore. Um, I think there's a risk here for, for Australia that um, the time to act on this stuff is now. So uh, we should be investing now, we should be building now. If we miss this ship, it's going to sail and it's going to go somewhere else. Um, and I think that that's not just about um, us in the room, it's also about government. I was very pleased to hear some of the uh, comments, the positive comments um, from the innovators here about how they've been supported by government. Um, I think Catapult um, particularly mentioned the support they've got, that's fantastic. Um, but I also think when we talk about Israel, we, we talk about uh, India or, or Manila, um, they have very specific government policies um, that push that innovation. I think in Israel, in fact, you do military service, or the option is you can go and innovate as long as the, the, the uh, government has a right to the code. So, so that, that's, that in itself drives a lot of young people into going into business, and they get to keep that business when they leave the military, right? So you've got a choice of shooting or, or actually developing, or take developing, right, safer. Um, but that sort of thinking from the government over there is terrific, and the, and the sort of thinking in, in uh, India and Manila and a lot of those countries where they allow startups to provide services to offshore companies, but not 
onshore companies means that they can grow the talent pool internally and, uh, and sooner or later they're, 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 uh, they're doing a lot of business. So I think for me, um, yes, innovation's good, yes, you know, RSA, um, uh, this, the, the pivot will provide opportunities for innovation. Um, and I think there's more Australia could be doing um, in the government to say, well, if, if we really want this, we need to act fast because uh, the pace is very quick and it will go overseas. Thanks very much. Uh, we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Uh, just up the back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a question for Robert. Um, with like uh, robots, like R2, D2, that can do sort of, I guess, um, labour in a, in a Western country, subject to government regulate, you know, government approval and the cost of the robot, how many years away is that? Now. Now, but I mean physically. But your Apple iPad, iPhone is being built by robots that Jeff Jabo developed. That manufacturing line of the future isn't of the future. It's of now. I'm thinking more of like a uh, like a, a waiter that's a robot or a waiter that does a what? gardening. Uh, it's like a robot that um, physical. Like a per, like well, that's happening in McDonald's. There's McDonald's now. You come in and there's no humans and there's just screens and you order your Big Mac and by putting in a Big Mac and a Big Mac comes out. Uh, that's happening already. And that's going to be a, a shift in jo uh, getting rid of some jobs. Yeah. Um, it's happening already. Uh, the future's here. It's just not evenly distributed. A lot of the stuff I showed you is just already here. It's just not very many people have it yet. It's coming. Uh, yeah, so. when am I going to? Is it? When am I going to just see robots everywhere? Is that five years away or ten? Uh, Self-driving cars are going to be ten to fifteen years, depending on who you talk to. Elon Musk probably says five, but he's a little aggressive because the lawyers are going to say, you know, it's a little bit. Uh, you need to sit down because you're going to have some business risks until you prove this to everybody. But it's coming. I've seen it. It drives next to me every day. Yeah, I, I, look, I, look, I see it at the McDonald's here. I mean, they, they don't need the people at the McDonald's. They just have them there. It's a good look having young people working there. Yeah. But they're not needed, like right now. But I visited a guy in Dubai. Uh, not Dubai, Brazil. Brazil's going through huge economic upheaval right now. Their economy is really in tr trouble, much more in trouble than you guys are. And he says, I get up every morning and I log into WeWork and I get some jobs from the internet, different kinds of jobs, and I do a few jobs there to make some rent. And then I uh, uh, open up my Uber app and I go drive some people around and I make some more money. There's new jobs coming. And you can either get in front of them and start thinking about how you're going to build new jobs or you can bemoan the fact that the old jobs are going away. The guy who builds the McDonald's is pretty happy with his job right now because he's building the, the signage and the computer in the McDonald's and that took a lot of highly skilled work to do that, right? So are you gonna be an economy for 2025, 20, 2030? and get ahead of this and spend a decade really investing in your local community and thinking about how do I bring smart people, smart musicians, smart uh, uh, artists, smart engineers, smart scientists, smart people here and having them uh, be fed here and happy here? Or do you let them go somewhere else and start companies? Instagram was started by two people sitting at a little table like that. Created a billion dollars of value. Why weren't they here? It can happen here. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. We've, we've got time for one more question. I think Nick down the front. Yeah, thanks for that, Monty. Um, I wanted to just reflect on what Robert said earlier. I think if we could get uh, that little snippet and cycle through that, that's a really good example of what we need to do here locally to get a startup community really flying. And uh, joining. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's lunch, probably. I, I was wearing so a different jacket. That's right. <laughs> Make sure people like him don't leave and go to Silicon Valley. 
Well, we won because it's such a beautiful place. But to go back to what you said and then um, Elizabeth earlier, the case study is Waterloo and the Tech Triangle is, that's exactly what they did. And then, and it, what did you say, Elizabeth? $18 billion in um, turnaround. And that, that's just an amazing thing. I did have a, Jody, this is like a devil's advocate type question. Um, I was, fantastic presentation. I didn't speak and I've just about spoken every opportunity I've had, but anyway. Um, the, how do you reconcile um, showing Apple and speak to your customers and yet Steve Jobs was famously known for saying, I will tell customers what they want? <laughs> this comes up every now and then. I think it's a bit of a, um, I don't know, maybe it's one of those Fordism kind of myths because I, um, I have friends that work around Apple and with Apple. I think that they do understand human behaviour. They've got a very strong design culture. Human-centred design is the, the whole shtick. Um, they're very focused on that. I think that that gets misinterpreted because I'm pretty sure what they don't like is what I agree with, which is market research. Um, don't ask people in a group situation to expect to give you sensical um, responses on, you know, well, oh, would you like a this? Would you like a that? You know, do you want a purple cow? Yes, of course you want a purple cow. Um, that's a surefire way to not succeed. But again, it's about um, great design and really having empathy and understanding for how a human's going to interact. And I, I would say that Apple is the best at that. Um, so yeah, whatever, whatever urban myth. Um, yeah, you guys probably know well, well, the inside skin. My, my best friend is Andy Grignan. He worked for Steve Jobs for 11 years, and he was one of the 12 guys who built the iPhone. And Steve would not let him hire anybody who had worked on a cell phone before. He said, "I want you to do something new." And here's the trio. Here's the you know this the Nokia. Go study it, fine, but I want something dramatically better. And you don't get dramatically better by talking in a committee. It, I worked at Microsoft, believe me, we tried that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because here's, here's the problem with the committee, because if, even if we just ask, to, where, where are we going to dinner tonight, right? You're gonna say, I wanna to go to Thai food, there's a great Thai place over here, and you're gonna say there's a great steak place over here, and you're gonna say there's a great fish place over here, and by the time I get over here, I'm like, I'm not gonna eat any of that, I'm going to the McDonald's, right? Because we can't decide in a committee, but if we just said, I know you like good food, you pick the place and tell us where to go, we're all gonna to go to a great meal, right? And some of us might not be completely happy, but we're gonna get a great meal, an ex exceptional meal. I just wanna build off of one thing because, you know, this is all right, and you know, what Jody started to touch upon is the part that I don't think gets told enough about the magic of Apple. Um, and sure, Steve Jobs is legend. I mean, it's, 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 you're, you're never really going to have that. Uh, and the one thing that he did very well, probably better than most people, was observe, and Jody used the, the word empathy, just observe people and observe trends. And if you think about it, you know, he didn't create the graphical user interface, he didn't build the mouse, he didn't create the portable music player. These are all things that he borrowed from other people. But he also, I mean, if, if at the time, if you, I used to program in, in DOS, uh, in BASIC, and that experience was horrible. Uh, and then the ability to have a graphical user interface and to make it far more elegant of an experience was just, he saw the possibilities. He connected the dots empathetically. Uh, the, if anybody used the earliest little MP3 players and and tried to manage your own music or even try to make your own MP3 files, it was a horrible experience. It was very complicated, reserved for the nerds. And that type of thinking anyone can do. You just have to start to observe the pain and let that translate into solutions that also unlock new opportunities as well. Wonderful. Well, we're just about at the end of uh, the day, but um, Robert, Brian, Jody, Elizabeth, Adam, thank you very much for not only your keynotes, but wonderful insights. And if I can ask for a round of applause for our guest speakers. And Marty. And Marty. Because generally, Brian and I get paid thirty or $40,000 to fly. We did this 
just because of Monty. <laughs> no, because of personal relationships, which is how the business world really works, and Monty uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Well, stay seated for a moment, guys, because we're just about uh, at drink o'clock for the day. But just before we wrap up, I want to acknowledge the committee that has worked tirelessly to make today possible. Leighton Wells, Nick Stanley, Mike Beck, Dwayne Dalton, Amir Katub, and Jennifer Cromedy. Big round of applause. And, uh, and before uh, Sarah Henderson uh, departed, uh, I think she's already committed you to, uh, to the 2016 event team. So start planning. Start planning now. You've got 365 and a bit days. It's not a leap year next year, is it? <laughs> it is a leap year next year. Well, there you go. We'll cut you short. Uh, on top of uh, the committee, uh, I just want to make mention of the sponsors, and we've talked enough about Telstra, but gold sponsors ICT, Geelong, Digital Smith, the Department of Employment, Fluid Group, Skilling the Bay, Tandem Vox, Department of Economic Development, Tribal, Frank Health Insurance, and that incredible watch, I think I'm looking forward to checking that out, Enterprise Geelong, Deakin University as the education partner and Samsung as the technology partner, Nalu Productions, Perfect Events, the City of Greater Geelong, and you've heard from the Mayor and his launch of Digital Geelong, what an inspiring contribution and, and active role he's played in today's event. Supporting partners, the peer, well I don't honestly think I've ever attended a conference in a more spectacular venue and Geelong's really put on the weather to make it extra special. BTS, I hope you got the chance to check their uh, install out uh, in the concourse area. Amia, Hydrix and of course Codacious who have been bringing the tweet wall to life throughout the day. Thank you very much everyone for making today such an incredible success. Massive thanks to all the audience members who've contributed and made today possible as well. Not possible without your financial contribution uh, in terms of ticket purchases and of course active participation in uh, social media throughout the day. I'm calling it a wrap guys, it's drink time. Thank you very much and another round of applause.